What's up, peeps? Today we have a man on a mission to help you find a job of your dreams. John Marty is a co-founder of Project 1B, and he's the senior product manager of new business innovation at Amazon. He's also a LinkedIn top voice with 250,000 followers and runs a popular YouTube channel where he shares LinkedIn tips, career advice, and a little bit of personal development. Joining us from his home state of Colorado, John, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Frank. It's awesome. Oh, man, I'm glad to have you on. Glad to have you share with the audience today. Before we jump into some Q&A, I'd love to, for you to give a little bit of a day in the life of John, who you are and what makes you tick. Yeah, man. So <clears throat> day in the life um, on the Amazon side of things, that occupies a lot of my, you know, my, my, my day time. Um, I'm working on some really, really fun projects. I've, I've, I've been really fortunate to land on an incredible team. You never know kind of what you're going to get in corporate America, right? Your, your experience is largely driven by the people that you work with. Uh, so it's not so much what you do, but it's who you work with. That's, that's really critical. And I'm just really fortunate to be on such an awesome team. And um, I, on the product management side, I get to design kind of new workflows and experience, new user experience, uh, user experiences for, for customers. And it's really fun for me to be kind of diving into those weeds and understanding like, well, if the, if the customer clicks here, then they go there. And if they do this, then what happens over here? And then what gets to populate over there? And then what's, what's like the negative scenario of this, like this, this whole kind of web of, um, you know, customer journeys on, uh, on the website. So that's really fun for me. I, I, I've been really enjoying that over the past couple of years. And, uh, and then on the side, I have a, a thing called Project 1B. Uh, it's a foundation I started, nonprofit, and it's all about helping uh, people convert the word and the chase for happiness to the chase for the word meaning. Because when you wind up chasing the word meaning instead of the word happiness, you wind up coming with a new set of questions that leads you in a different direction uh, for your life. So that's a big passion project for me. And uh, yeah, man, that's, that's, that's day in the life. A lot of content creation, a lot of YouTube, a lot of just engaging with the community on LinkedIn. I love it. So it's just a lot of fun. Yeah, that's great. And what I, what I really like, I love, I love having, you know, I started a show and did this really not for, for me to, to gain anything, but to, to bring folks into my audience and to, to people with interesting stories and things to share. One of my favorite things about doing this is I get to kind of be the internet sleuth and go find out information. Yeah, you're the hunter. You're the hunter. <laughs> and, and, and of course it takes, you know, I like a certain type of person on the show. So once I'm like, okay, wow, this person seems interesting. Then it's like, are they really interesting? What are they all about? Sure. And, and it's been fun to learn a little bit about you. I think because of your journey to where you are, and, and people always think of, you know, the, the, the end of, like, oh, a, a job at Facebook, a job at Amazon, a job yeah, at yeah, Google. Yeah, yeah. It's like these big, massive companies and, 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 and the excitement. And, and of course, you are just described that you're yeah. in an awesome role and get to do some great things. But you started off, you were a founder, you, you had a company, uh, you had yeah. a successful exit from what I understand. And then, yeah. and then you, you, you did some other things after that. And uh, it didn't go so well. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> things went like, whoosh. <laughs> but that's, that's, it's awesome because it's, it's really part of your journey and part yeah. of where you got to, how you got to where you are today. That's, that's the exciting part. People always yeah. think, oh, wow, you know, someone's on top. They see things, perception. And they don't really know the backstory of, okay, yeah. this is how John got here. So if you yeah. wouldn't mind, I, we'd love to hear a little bit of the, the backstory of you and, 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 and kind of, you know, had, had the company, some of those ups yeah. and downs. And if you'd love to share some of those experiences with us, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. So <clears throat> uh, when I was in college, I had this, I had this dream to be an entrepreneur. Right? I think, you know, like a lot of people, I think that that was the mental model for a successful life. And I took it, right? I said, you know, how do I do this? Because I don't want to be in corporate America. I want to be an entrepreneur because corporate is bad, right? Corporate equals failure for me. There was just some weird mental construct that I had and, I, and entrepreneurship equals success and freedom and happiness, right? So I said, okay, well, I want to go that direction. And so uh, junior year of college, it was this class, this entrepreneurship class. And they said, well, you know, create a, create a business plan. <clears throat> it was the first time 
in college, in my college experience that I actually became interested in something because it was relatable to what I wanted to do. And so, you know, I created this business plan. I looped in a, uh, you know, a, a business partner. Well, it wasn't a business at that point. It was just an idea. Um, a buddy of mine from, from college. And we started up this uh, electronics business essentially. So the business plan, um, you know, got us to a point of thinking, you know, what we could do. And it was turned out to be this little 700 square foot electronics store in Durango, Colorado, little town. Um, we had, we had no money. Um, and we stuck with it for, well, I stuck with it for 10 years and that wound up turning out to be a, uh, a couple million in sales, uh, you know, revenue annual. We had 10 employees, first couple years. I mean, it was just up and down, up and down. We never knew if we were going to actually go out of business and run, totally run out of cash. That's the biggest problem with an entrepreneurial venture. It's like cash flow, cash flow, cash, cash flow. And the Iraq war broke out. Uh, it was like George Bush's uh, uh, you know, Iraq war at the time. And we freaked out. We saw these news thing, you know, things on the news. We didn't have a single sale for three months. And me and my buddy, we were looking at each other, my partner, we were looking at each other like, this is it. We're in three months. This is it. We're done. <laughs> Biggest failure ever. We just started. And it turns out like we, we, we wound up coming out of it and it was like a magical thing. We, we didn't even know how it happened. P customers just started coming in. Maybe they felt sorry for us because there's 21 year old uh, kids that were trying to start this business that had no product in the store. But we wound up kind of making it through the rough patch and you know, I, uh, but, but after about 10 years, I, I really started to kind of say like, what's more, what can I do that's a little different than this? I was tired of being in a small town. Um, I took, I, I sold my shares to my partner and I took the earnings from that to uh, start a, a startup in Miami, Florida. It was a smart home technology uh, software and hardware company. It was right before Google Home and, um, you know, Amazon Alexa and all these things really hit the market this kind of like cheap ecosystem of products. There was no such thing back then in, in, in 2012, 2013. Uh, so uh, the short story of that is that it failed. Uh, it became an epic failure after about a year and a half, two years. And um, during that time, I, was, I funneled all my cash into it. And so I had a little bit of cash left when I, when I said, I got I to gotta get out of this. This thing's killing me. And... I basically made it for a few months and I was running out of cash. I mean, I basically had nothing. I, I got to the point where I was super desperate and started working at Best Buy. Um, nobody would hire me, man. I, I, I literally, I couldn't believe it. Um, I, I said, how could, how could I be in this position of, you know, going from startup to startup um, after 13 years and then having my resume say founder and I thought that was super valuable in the industry, right? But it actually turned out to be one of the, the worst things that I could have on my resume because I didn't fit the mold, right? And so recruiters looked at me and said, they actually said to me, John, we're afraid that you're going to try to take our company secrets and start your own business. And I'm like, guys, I'm not interested in that. I, like, I spent 13 years. I'm super burnt out. I need to eat. So I would like to have a job. And people were like, and I think that desperation caused this negative spiral um, because I projected that desperation onto people and, and, um, and they reacted to it in a way that, that wasn't like the founder, right? It was just this, this desperate guy. And no, nobody wanted to give me a job, man. So I just strolled into Best Buy one day and I was like, guys, look, I, I need a job. <laughs> you know, I'm willing to get paid hourly. I have, I have been in the electronics world for 13 years. Just put me on the floor. And they, they gave me a Best Buy shirt and they put me in the little Magnolia home theater section. And they were just like, cool, man, 12 bucks an hour. Go for it. <laughs> that was, that was it, man. And so I, uh, you know, I, I, I did that, uh, for a while and, and I, I had this hypothesis that, you know, I needed to get back on my feet and, and I needed to make some money. Uh, so I went back to school. I took out student loans to get an MBA and went to software development school. And uh, I, I wound up getting a job at American Express. They gave me a shot. 
uh, after after doing the reinvention, and that then led me to uh, Amazon in kind of a roundabout way. It's crazy how things work, you know. Well, I mean, you just there's so much that you just talked. There's about. so like, much there, bro. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> and and that people like really need to listen to and take into consideration because. It's funny. We, we laugh about it now and you can laugh about it. Oh like, yeah. I, like me too. Like I just started my fifth company yeah. and I can't, you know, like I laugh sometimes where I'm like, I love, to, I wouldn't apply. I, I actually made a, a LinkedIn post about it one time where I didn't even fit the qualifications. When we made a job posting on LinkedIn, I was like three of the 10 qualifications. So I was like, <laughs> I can't even get hired at my own company according totally. to LinkedIn. So, but that's the thing. It's like, as, as founders, we feel like we, we, we've done so much. You've, you've been the janitor, you've done the payroll, you've done oh, all the roles totally. and then you can't get a job somewhere because yeah. of the fact that your experience is like people are kind of taken away by it or, or they have yeah. a misconception or whatever it was. And, and again, you just wanted to get paid. Um, yeah. So, and it's, and that's the thing. It's a reality. Not only that you, you built a company, you, you had the, the roller coaster. I, I think it's so important that you talked about that because people think that, being the entrepreneur, being the founder, running the organization is always, it's, it's the, it's the stuff you see on Instagram that people yeah, share and, it's and, not, and it is, it's making payroll and not like the, the stuff that keeps you up at night. It's like, Oh, wow. You know, you didn't have sales for three months. We mm -hmm. got to make money. You know, we have yeah. people, especially when you have, and you got to pay your people. You got to pay your people yes. right before you, before you always. And, and you have, that's the thing when you have, once you have employees, it's, it's easy to be the founder and the CEO of a one person yeah. organization. Yeah. Yeah. You've got people that show up to work and they have bills to pay and they, re they rely on that paycheck. It yep. adds way more stress to you. So, yep. so you did all that. Um, and then, and then again, you, you're saying, Hey, you had this moment where you were like, I'm done. Yeah. I, I've had enough of this. You got yeah. out, which was great because a lot of people don't get out and they yeah. can just let themselves burn completely out. Yeah. And then you go, you oh, I was company. completely burnt out, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. And, and you start this, the new company and, you know, you figure, okay, you've had success. And it's so funny because my second company for me was a, was a failure. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the thing. It's like, okay, I found success. I can yeah. do this again. And then you don't, and you're like, oh, wow, and I'm, am I cut out for this? And you start to re, and, and again, you start to kind of reevaluate what you're doing. You right. sort of went through a little bit of that where you're like, all right, I'm going to go find a job. I think I read somewhere that you did like 150 job applications or something oh, and, man. and couldn't At find least, a job. Yeah. And, yeah. and if I was, if I'm correct, I don't, you, was your, were you expecting a baby at, around that time? Yeah. It, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. So, I mean, that's right. like, yeah. Right at the exit, right at that second, that second point or the second company where I was like, I have to get out of this. Like I am going to be totally broken a few months. Like I need to, I need to get out. And that was right when we were expecting. Yeah. So the, the, the added stress, it's like, okay, yeah, man. Yeah. So there you are. And then, you know what? It's, it's an awesome story because then you, you were humble enough. You're like, I need money. Yeah. Uh, give me the job at Best Buy. I, I'll take yeah. the job. Some like I'll take like, it. Oh, I'll take it. Work there. You, know, yeah. well, you you needed to provide your family, all that stuff. So so yeah. great. And, and that is a great part of the story that you took the job and then you, you invest reinvested in yourself, going back yeah. to school and, and doing yeah. those things. Got you know yeah. uh, picked up by um, American Express, and now you, you got your home at Amazon. So yeah. how much of how much of your story? that you, that, oh, that experience, I mean, that, that has helped you, I, I think. So the content you put out the people, I, I feel like some of the stuff you put out in the reactions, I was going through some of your content over the past few months and just reading through some of the yeah. comments from people. And there's some pretty awesome heartfelt comments that people hit you up in the in yeah. LinkedIn. How, how much, so how, first of all, two part question, I guess, yeah. how much yeah. of, of your backstory do you throw into your LinkedIn content and really help yeah. people see like, Hey, I've been there. And then the feedback you get, is that some fuel that keeps you going? Yeah. I think that I, I constantly post about failure because I don't want people to think that I'm here without that, you know? And so, cause I think a lot, I think a lot of people would just say like, Oh, well, John's in this place. And so he must be here and this and that. And it's like, no, Right. There was this kind of six year transition period 
that was rock bottom to this point, which, which is, um, which was the most important lesson that I had. Uh, and so I use, I use that a lot and I, you know, I love interacting with the community because I, I, I want them to know that like the failure is the thing that actually makes you really strong. You know, and so people are so afraid of it. I think they're afraid of it from school too, because you're not supposed to fail in school. And if you fail in school and you get bad grades and you're going to be a failure, right? And it's not that way at all. In fact, when you fail in the real world, those are the things that make you really strong if you let them. If you, if you, if you don't kind of wallow in your own, you know, negative spiral, um, and if you ask yourself the right questions and if you take responsibility for, for what happened, I think that's really key, right? Cause if you wind up saying, well, and I post about this this morning, if you wind up saying, well, uh, you know, how did this happen to me? Then you're in this constant spiral of not actually wondering why it happened. And then you're not taking responsibility. You're not saying, what could I have done differently? Right. And because when you start saying, what can I have done differently? And then when you start then reflecting on the gratitude for the experience and the perspective you've gained from that, then you can kind of say, wow, I'm so thankful. Right. And I got to that place of gratitude. Like I'm so thankful I went through this experience and that was my fuel that I used to kind of get to, to where I'm at today. So I love posting about that stuff. And, um, yeah, I think I, I think that those are the types of messages that really resonate with people, especially in this time of COVID nineteen. So you do you got a couple mediums where you're pushing out content. Yeah, you got you know you have some stuff that you, you kick out on on YouTube. Um, I know you've done a lot of speaking events over time and, and got yeah. in front of some audiences. I actually met you at a, a speaking event that you did. So so uh, how. How, how do you find time to dedicate to, you know, you, you've got your, your, your job at yeah. Amazon and then you've got your family life and then you've got a lot of other things that you're doing. How do, how do you, how do you break it down and how do you focus your energy and your time to say, okay, here's the things I want to get done. Here's what I can get done and, yeah. and, uh, and share a little bit of that. Yeah. So, I mean, at work, I single task. Mm -hmm. So I will look at the entire week of events and meetings and everything there. And I'll say, what's the one thing? Uh, there's a book called Essentialism. I forgot the author, but you know, it breaks down, um, it, it breaks down like what is essential? 90% of your entire day is complete bullshit and 10% is valuable. Right. So what is truly essential for your day that actually uh, is going to move the needle for where you work and then what is essential for me to do on linkedin and youtube to continue moving the needle and when i break things down that way all of it becomes really simple because I, I, and I'm a product manager as well. So product managers are all about prioritization and, you know, uh, recognizing what's the most important thing and then deprioritizing everything else. So that's kind of ingrained in me uh, from, from, from work as well. But uh, it, it's funny because people often ask me that question, like, John, how do you find the time? And I'm like, I have plenty of time. You know, um, I prioritize my day uh, well at work. I focus on one, getting one major thing done in the week. Nothing else matters. And then when it comes to like YouTube content creation, I'll sit down for an hour on a Saturday and chunk out a few videos and that's, that's it. Right. And then I'll, I'll drip them out. And same with like LinkedIn content. Like, um, you know, last night I wrote a post, great. I posted it this morning. Um, I'll engage with the community for a couple of days and then I'll post again in a, in a few days. Right. And so, uh, it, it's actually not that much when you, uh, when you, when you break it down. Let me ask you this, your, your experiences that you've had and, and is that, um, what you've went through, is that part of the reasoning behind Project 1B? Totally. 100%. 100%. Because I think when I was in college, right, if you think about, think about like your college journey, my college journey, everyone's college journey. And I, and I get tons of comments on LinkedIn as well that I'm, that I'm constantly getting tapped into the, uh, the energy of, of, of what's going on in the community, right? And you have all these students, myself included, who went through college and said, I want to be happy. Right? That was the goal. The goal was happiness. And, and yet we never explored the rationale behind it. And so 
the happiness meant money. The more money I had, the more happy I would be. So there's this direct hidden correlation between happiness and money, right? And so if I become rich, then I'll be really happy. But if I become moderately wealthy, I'm going to be moderately happy. It's very strange societal correlation that we have. Um, and so, uh, but I've, I've, I've kind of seen on the other side of this that like it's, it's total smoke and mirrors. And so what I want to push back onto my younger self, and the reason why I use the hashtag on LinkedIn, student voices, is because I'm speaking to myself at 20. I'm saying it's not that word that we should be chasing because the word is correlated to something in society that we don't even know that it's correlated to, which is money, right? If you chase the word meaning, then you're going to have a different set of questions that you start asking yourself. You go, well, wait a second. I thought money was meaning but actually money is not meaning. And if I chase the word meaning, right? So, so, so then you start saying, well, like what would be meaningful to me? And usually that's rooted in something that's a, you know, a personal story. Um, and uh, it just leads to a better path. So I, I, my, my hope for project one B is that the simple replacement of the word happiness with the word meaning in that chase if I could just spread that message alone, just that one thing, um, I think that we would all be in a better, uh, we'd, we'd all be in a better spot. Yeah, and there is, there's a lot of, you know, you mentioned something that I think is, makes total sense. And of course, to the audience that's listening in, we're taught failure so early in life. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, we, that's just, it's ingrained in us. It's, yeah. I can't fail, can't fail. Can't, can't fail, fail, can't fail. Yeah. Mm -mm. And, mm -mm. and it's funny, as you talk about some of your failures have been your, your greatest, you know, sort of like your springboard. Best assets, yeah. Yeah, and, and for, I, mean, I, re I relate to that. I think, you know, like I mentioned earlier, one of my companies that failed, I had two that failed actually, but I, they were the biggest learning for me, like stuff that I was like, this happened, I get it, never going to happen again. On my, right. And I moved on my fourth company, those things were like, I, I know. So the, the failures are things that I've learned to embrace, but- yeah. It took me, you know, as I got older, to really kind of flip that and understand the meaning of failure and how to embrace yeah. failure. And I think what you're doing now by trying to flip that around and, and get, get that out to, to, to the audience is, is great because I think the earlier we can start to realize things um, and understand meaning of, yeah. of just like success, you know, like right. the, the premise of the show, success I do this success isn't all about the stuff you see on, on, on social media. Most of no. it is a lie. Um, so, so love that you're doing that. What's a, what's a piece of advice that you would give to folks tuning in that you would just love to share where it's a piece of something, if they were going to take something away from John Marty, this, this would be it. Share a piece of advice. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we, we, we touched on a little bit on the, from the failure, failure side of things and the chase for happiness versus meaning. Um, you know, one thing that, um, one thing that I'd probably want to tell the audience is that I failed out of high school mm -hmm. and, uh, and everything wound up turning out. Okay. And so uh, yeah, there's so much wrapped up into the grades and school and a, 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 an army of teachers has you believe that you need to follow all these steps to have the right life. And yet I followed none of them and everything turned out just fine. So I, that, that's what I would love to, I think, instill on the community, right? Like there's, there's a lot wrapped up into the type of school you go to and the degree that you get. And should I be studying this versus that? There's this paradox of choice going on in the world, right? I have a billion choices. I could choose anything I want in life. And yet that causes people this intense struggle. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do this? Is this okay? Is that okay? And ultimately, it's all okay. It's all okay. It's, it, it winds up coming down to mindset. Even when I wound up working at Best Buy for $12 an hour, what's really hilarious about that experience as I reflect on it is that when I was working there, I actually really enjoyed my job. And yet today, I really enjoy my job as well. And I'm making exponentially more. So, 
I, I just find that, that the irony in it, uh, the whole thing. So anyway, that's, I think that's my roundabout way of, uh, uh, of saying you really don't have to follow a traditional path, right? Like just pick something that interests you and, and recognize that when you fail, that is going to be the best experience if you let it be the best experience. Well, so. appreciate that. I think that was well put, and um, and definitely you know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of meaning behind it. Because especially with the comparison of, you were happy at Best Buy. You loved doing what you do. It was the money? Yeah. Did, would, would more money have been great? Sure. Like of course, right? <laughs> yeah. but, you know, it's not like people get people make a ton of money and are stuck in miserable jobs. I know. Like, well, maybe maybe you shouldn't find something different where maybe the money is, it's not worth it to have the extra money to be so miserable every day. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so that the correlation makes total sense. Um, one of the favorite things I like to ask my guests is uh, a little glimpse into the future. So now let's say John is giving us your view um, if five years from now, where are we going to be? Where, where do you, where do you see things going? Yeah. I mean, tech, you know, uh, tech in the past few years has really taken off, right? You have the Facebooks of the world, you have the Amazons of the world, um, you have a lot of companies. I, I believe that a lot of companies are going to start emerging in this whole like biotechnology space. Um, the rate of te technological change is uh, is exponential, and and we're seeing it today, right? You're seeing like uh, Elon Musk, Neuralink. Uh, you know, tapping that computer chip into your brain and having it connect to your smartphone, right? Um, and having it be able to kind of cure uh, or the potential to cure uh, Parkinson's and to help people restore their, their vision and to help paraplegics walk uh, and move their, you know, limbs again, right? There's just these insane technological things that are going on right now. You have, uh, you know, uh, drone technology being applied to vehicles. You have incredible GPS mapping. Uh, so I think in the next five years, you're going to see this uh, even more exponential uh, kind of hockey stick type of, uh, of growth as all these industries start emerging. And I think it's really exciting. I, I mean, I, I don't know exactly where it's going to go, but I just see some of these things um, that are going to probably emerge out of COVID-19, a lot of touchless technology, um, you know, touchless services, they're going to, going to emerge. And uh, yeah, I mean, who knows where it all winds up going, but what I do know is that it will be exponential and it'll be, it'll be even in five years, it'll be beyond what you and I can even comprehend because what we comprehend is something linear, mm -hmm. right? We say like, well, what's our next step? How do we get to the next step? How do I make this you know, next piece of my journey? Whereas technology goes, and it ex it, it's, 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 it's explosive. So, uh, and I think that that's, that's going to mean a lot of jobs, uh, you know, in the, in the tech industry. And I think, you know, from a career perspective, since I give so much career advice, I think it's really important for, uh, for people who are jumping into the job market or people midway in their careers, if they're in an industry that is dying, right? that is getting eaten by technology, if they're in customer service, right? If they're in, um, you know, as a, a hospitality, there's all these industries that are doing quite poorly right now, and they may continue to do poorly over the next handful of years. And it's not a good place to be, right? You want to be in an arena that is growing during this time um, and, 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 and growing as you kind of visualize what, what the future might, might be. Great stuff. And, and yeah, the, the, I, I think a lot of new stuff just over the past few months, like we think about technology and it's like, you hear parents, you know, like my, Oh, when we were younger, this, and it's like stuff took forever. Yeah. And then, and you know, yeah. we, I, we can look back and see things and how things have progressed, you know, computers and yeah. consoles. And now my I got eight year old daughter and it's like, stuff is flying. And then even this past know, six man. months, again, it's like the stuff that's people, there's a lot of people that have been sitting at home do, coming up with amazing things. Uh, I know. So yeah, you're right. I, I feel oh, like there's good. some stuff's going to come out of this that we're, we're like, whoa. So I know, yeah, I know. It's not, well, I love that you were on today. Where, 
where can people find you? Where can, where do they go if they want to connect? Where do they go if they want to learn more about Project 1B? Uh, so let them know. Yeah, yeah. So um, mostly on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I'm posting almost daily on LinkedIn. Uh, you can follow me there. You can also follow the YouTube channel. Uh, I'm posting about weekly on the YouTube channel. But most of the engagement, really, if you really want to you know, jump into the conversation uh, or ask me any questions, most of the engagement's are all on LinkedIn. So easy place to find me. Project 1B uh, updates are all um, on LinkedIn as well. So yeah, pretty easy to find me. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and your sharing and your knowledge. Awesome work that you're doing out there um, on LinkedIn and YouTube, of course. So keep it up. Uh, thanks, glad to man. have you on and uh, I look forward to releasing this episode. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. Thanks for having me, Frank. You bet. Yeah.